today I'm going to be talking about uh, simulating vehicles. And uh, the motivation for this problem should be pretty obvious. Uh, vehicles are an important part, uh, an often, often actually iconic part of TV, movies, video games, as you can probably recognize from this slide. Uh, and it's kind of surprising that nobody's really done a whole lot of work on vehicle simulation in the graphics uh, community. <laughs> Um, so here's the, an example of the kind of animation we might like to make. There's a lot of complexity here. Uh, there's some controls on this helicopter that's flying through this stone arch, such as the uh, angle of the helicopter blade. The pilot might be reacting to his proximity to the rock. Um, there are all the typical forces, such as inertia and wind and gravity. Uh, but one thing in particular that's difficult to deal with is in vehicles is that there are certain kinds of constraints uh, that, that don't show up in a lot of the systems that we're used to simulating. So as a really simple example, imagine we're uh, trying to parallel park a car. And unless we have a really fancy car, uh, we can't slide directly into the parking spot. So we know there's some kind of constraint here. Um, but uh, if you're talented enough, you can still, through a sequence of uh, very careful maneuvers, get into that exact same position. So it's clear that whatever the constraint on our system is, is it's not just a constraint on position. It's a constraint on the motion of the car. And this kind of constraint is called a non-holonomic constraint, some constraint that can't be expressed purely in terms of the configuration or the position of your system. So in graphics, we're really used to dealing with holonomic systems, uh, sy systems where the constraints are in terms of position. And sort of the mental image you have is, usually that you have some constraint manifold uh, that you have to stay on at all times. And there's a lot of approaches to, to enforcing these kinds of constraints. Usually the idea is we're going to compute some force that pushes us back down onto this constraint manifold. But the problem with non-holonomic systems is, well, it's not a constraint on position. We don't have this kind of manifold. So, so we can't uh, enforce our constraints in this way or any related way. So we really need a new approach here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that today. So the goals of this work were to answer the question of how do we deal with these more general kinds of constraints, these non-holonomic constraints. And once we have a nice representation um, for these constraints, how do we work them into integrators that are robust? And, and by that I mean integrators that can deal with large time steps, uh, huge forces, things that we, we'd like to be able to use in graphics and not have to worry about whether our system is going to behave as expected. So briefly, to give an overview of our, our approach, we're going to sort of tie three technologies together. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the idea of a non-holonomic connection, which is going to be used to encode these more difficult types of constraints. Um, then I'm going to talk about representing the configuration space of our vehicle. So vehicles can often have complex, curved configuration spaces, and we'd like to have a natural way of, of dealing with that. And I'm also going to talk about variational principles or variational integrators, which will help us to get these robust types of integrators that I, that I mentioned. So we're going to tie these all together to get sort of a generic integrator for vehicles. And this is something that's described explicitly in our paper. And so then if you want to go simulate any particular vehicle, you just plug in a description of your vehicle and you'll get out a final update rule. Um, and Describing your vehicle is actually pretty straightforward. We just need a few simple ingredients. For instance, we need uh, equations defining the constraints on the system. Uh, we need to know what the configuration space of our vehicle is. So for instance, the car, the configuration space would be rotations and translations in the plane. Uh, we need to know the kinetic energy of the system, usually something like 1 half mv squared, and any external forces. And we have detailed examples of uh, how to sort of plug in a vehicle description and get out of an integrator in the paper for the case of a helicopter, boat, car, some, some standard examples. OK, so let's take a look at these various technologies in more detail. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about how to enforce these uh, more difficult types of constraints, these non-holonomic constraints. So let's go back to our example of the car. We can describe the configuration of the car using several coordinates, for instance, the rolling angle of the rear tire, the angle of the steering wheel, and also the position and orientation in the plane. And it's going to be convenient to encode all this information in a single vector Q. 
which we're actually going to break apart into two additional pieces, R and G. Uh, R is going to represent the shape of the vehicle, meaning what the driver has control over, so the, the rear wheel angle and the steering angle. And G is going to represent the pose, meaning where the car actually goes, what do we actually observe. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. To describe our vehicle, we also need to give the constraints. Uh, so for instance, in this sideways sliding constraint, we can derive this by just saying we're going to dot the uh, linear velocity vector with the sideways direction and set that equal to zero. And we already know that this is a non-holonomic constraint just by observing the behavior of the car during parallel parking. Again, we know that we can't express this constraint purely in terms of position. But now the question is, how do we actually encode these constraints numerically uh, so that we can use them in our integrator? And the perspective that we're going to take here is that changes in shape cause changes in pose. So turning my wheel or turning my rear tire is going to cause the car to go somewhere. It's a pretty intuitive idea. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a uh, vector r dot, a change in our shape, and we're going to plug it into something called a non-holonomic connection. And it's going to spit out some information that's going to tell us how to adjust our pose to respect the constraints. So specifically, if we have this non-holonomic connection A, uh, we apply it to our change in shape R dot, and it's going to give us the difference between the locked velocity, meaning the velocity of the system if there are no shape changes, if we're not actually turning the steering wheel, and the true velocity of the system, meaning the velocity of the system uh, as it should be if we're respecting the constraints. And so we can think of this uh, quantity that the connection spits out as sort of a correction or course correction to our trajectory that makes it respect the constraints. In our case, uh, for the vehicles we, we study in this paper, we're going to encode this connection simply as a, a matrix, and we can get this by differentiating our constraints. And so we can express any linear constraint on velocities. OK, how does this connection work into our update rule? Well, it's, it's sort of what I said. To get our new configuration from our old one, we're just going to multi multiply our time step times the typical velocity of our system, meaning the velocity we'd get uh, you know, integrating, ignoring these constraints, uh, minus this correction term. And so let's take a look at what, what happens if we integrate our system using this connection to enforce constraints. So in, 